Today on Billiards Digest Live, the women take center stage for Women's History Month. Las Vegas plays host to five big pro tournaments, big announcements from Matchroom and the WPA, and a sit down with the great Allison Fisher. So settle in for a new episode of Billiards Digest Live coming at you right now. This is an actual quote from a British newspaper article from the 1890s. Happy Women's History Month, and welcome to this episode of Billiards Digest Live. I'm Mike Pinozo, and this is not the reporter who wrote that phrase. This is Jason Bowman. Most definitely not. As a guy who's lost, History Month as a guy who's lost to many a women on the pool table, most definitely not a quote attributed to me. Most definitely. <laughs> Should be a lot of fun, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Great We've month. We've got a great episode in store for you. And we're going to start by celebrating the role, impact, and contributions of women throughout the history of our great sport. You know, we tend to think of women in billiards as a relatively recent phenomenon, but the truth is women have always played the game. They were just never respected as players. Written pieces as early as the 1400s make reference to women playing billiard games. Of course, one of the most notable billiard enthusiasts was said to be Marie Antoinette, who history claims played billiards with King Louis XVI on the eve of the French Revolution. Now, there's no record of what game they were playing or what the stakes were, but I'm pretty sure it was cutthroat. <laughs> Bravo. Well, who writes Bravo. this stuff, right? <laughs> now, in the U.S., it wasn't until the early 1900s that women actually patronized billiard halls and they were depicted playing in movies as early as the 1940s. The first great American female pool player was Ruth McGinnis, who was a child star and played from the 1920s through the 1950s. Because women's tournaments didn't really exist at that time, McGinnis toured the country playing straight pool against top male players, routinely winning. She even beat legendary world champion Ralph Greenleaf. The post-hustler pool boom of the 1960s saw an increase in participation among women, and even saw men saw, saw new rooms catering to women. Traditional pool tournaments and competitions soon followed. Women's championships at that time were dominated by Dorothy Wise. When the Billiard Congress of America established a women's division at the annual U.S. Open, the first national championship for women, Wise, then in her 50s, won the first five titles. Ironically, the California grandmother was dethroned in 1972 by then 13-year-old Jean Belukas, who promptly won seven U.S. Open titles in a row. Many pool enthusiasts still consider Belukas, who at 26 became the youngest player ever inducted into the Billiard Congress of America Hall of Fame, the greatest woman player of all time. But it was in 1976 that the road to professionalism really changed for women in the U.S., when a handful of ambitious and competitive women players formed what was originally called the Women's Professional Billiard Alliance. The bold group even ran an ad in the National Billiard News that read, are you a woman who doesn't have to wear a skirt to prove it? Join the Women's Professional Billiard Alliance. That's gold. In the 1990s, women's pool in the U.S. took center stage with the evolution of the WPBA Classic Tour. With a dozen tournaments a year and hours of coverage on ESPN, the lady pros displayed style, intensity, passion, and high-level talent, and in the process, raised the visibility of the entire sport and business. Women pool players continue to be the beacon for the sport, but even the stars of today face challenges in following their dreams. We recently sat down with some of the world's top women players to talk about those journeys. What was your first experience playing pool where you noticed the difference between the way women and men were treated as players? Um, I would say I started playing at the age of 11 and like the whole community was dominated by men, right? So I remember going to the pool hall every practice session, every tournament, it was men dominance, right? So in order to improve, I figured that it would be great for me to start playing tournaments with the guys 
So I didn't really play a lot of women tournament growing up, so I kind of got used to be around guys. They treated me like I think you would expect most men in a pool room treating a 19-year-old woman, 19, 20-year-old woman would be treated, right? I mean, I think I was there more as an object to like look at instead of being respected as a player. Most likely the man told me a woman cannot be as good as a man. Um, I shouldn't be on the team because I'm a woman, but, um, you know, I always had the support of my dad and he taught me to be a strong woman, so um, I never really cared. It's a little different because also when you're not, I feel like, positive side, when you're not playing your best, there's always people still cheering for you, saying it's a ride, it's going to be, you know, uh, eventually it's going to be good and stuff like that. Versus when man is playing bad, they're all like just, oh, you're just terrible. You have to quit, <laughs> sell your keys. <laughs> so <laughs> that's the positive part of being a girl. And the negative part is uh, obviously, you know, sometimes way too much attention. And, you know, unless you're seeking or loving this attention, sometimes it can be too much because there's obviously more women in pool than men. So women are getting targeted more. Uh, because of just our, uh, you know, my, minority, if I can say yeah. that. What have been the biggest challenges for you as a, as a, as a woman player? Well, as we talked about yesterday, the short fingers. <laughs> <laughs> but also, uh, sometimes it's tough to focus on one thing at a time because of how, you know, woman brain works where you can multitask a lot of things so sometimes you think about so many things and it's it's sometimes tough to really um you know pull yourself together and focus on one thing at a time honestly the biggest challenge was probably just kind of asserting dominance like you're here to take the sport very seriously you know a lot of people i shouldn't say a lot i was very lucky growing up as a junior because i came in you know the junior scene when it was really really popping you know and, and a lot was happening but uh a couple people you know thought it was a joke when I would show up for my match and they were like oh no 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 who's my actual opponent you know because I mean I was nine when I started playing pool so I, I understand that thought process behind that some of the challenges for me are uh for example my just my uh, you know my structure <laughs> because I'm I'm a little bit shorter in general like women are a little bit shorter and um, also when I have to, I mean, because of our physical structure, sometimes it bothers us in some shots or on the break when we can just, we don't have as much space <laughs> as some guys, if you know what I mean. Um, then another challenge is uh, just the way our brain is wired because for us it's a little bit harder to not get distracted when playing a match for a long time. For guys, I feel it's much easier to just stay focused and just focus on that one thing for long and long and long and girls are kind of just just for women it's easier to listen to voices around us just get distracted easier and uh another thing about our brain is that like our emotions are kind of get into our game more often than not and with the guys so a few challenges there i don't know what it is but there is a difference between how women are running the rack and how men are running the rack. I feel like the man's brain is just sees the simplicity and I don't want to offend anybody by saying that, but I feel like men are very just goal oriented and they're very simple. Women just think about so many things at a time. It's just the way nature designed us, right? So if you look at the layouts of the runouts that men are doing, you can see the big difference. It's just easier, simpler, right? Less complicated. Are there barriers that you still face being a woman? Yeah, there are still barriers. I still meet men who probably don't even really play pool. And when they find out that I am a woman professional or a retired, semi-retired professional, whatever you want to call it, they will still say, oh, if I have a couple of drinks, I'm pretty sure I can beat you. I, I play really well. You know, you just face that chauvinism a lot in the pool room. And uh, it, can be, it can be difficult to hold your tongue because you don't want to come across as harsh or, or be branded as a, as a Karen or, or difficult to deal with. But at the same time, you want to stand your ground. The way women are sexualized in the game, right? So uh, you really have to make sure that you curve your path through 
by your ability, by your skill, because there's certain players, certain women who definitely are objectified a lot. And I think it came from 90s, the way women used to dress when they played pool. So it was more like a sexual object for men. Right, so nowadays I feel like because of the dress code and because uh, myself and all other women are carrying ourselves so professionally, it's not a thing anymore, right? We are professionals, we're dressed professionally and we want to be treated equally according to our skill level, right? We, I, I don't think any of us would like to be seen as an object, but professional. Well... To start with, as we don't have as many tournaments as men and our prize money is not as big, which is also an understanding because there's less people watching women pool, I suggest. And uh, it's, it's definitely, definitely a struggle to also improve your game. You always have to compete with men. And it's great, like sometimes you, you know, you lose to a better player, you have an opportunity to learn, but also when you enter every single man tournament and you lose, 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 sometimes it might shake your confidence a little bit. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a great thing to compete with men, but sometimes it also have a downside of losing your confidence a little bit. Name women who inspire you, either pole players or not. Honestly, a tennis player named Iga Swiatek. Uh, I don't know if I'm saying her last name right, but she is like a woman that's really inspired me in sport. She's just a super strong tennis player and very focused and maybe a little more reserved. She's not like one of the tennis players who's always out there um, trying to talk with everybody and be super popular or famous. She's just really focused in on what she's doing and like just playing tennis. She's really dialed in. You know, Women that inspire me are women that are strong competitors, but also good human beings. You know, um, they are kind to their fans. They are kind to other players. You know, when, when I came up in the WPBA, there were some women that really went for, I think, intimidation techniques. You know, you, you become friends with them later, but in the beginning, they really want to show you who's boss. And then there are some who are just kind to you no matter what, right off the bat. So uh, ones that come to mind are Kelly Fisher, has always been a really kind human being. Uh, Jasmine, she even though she's a little bit shy, she was always really warm and welcoming. And uh, Monica, Jennifer Beretta. But off the table, I think s strong competitors like Serena Williams, I mean, just your kind of standard ones that you, you think about when you think of women in uh, sports. When I was younger, when I was growing up, I was really inspired by Princess Diana. She was like my role model in life because she just dedicated so much time and effort helping other people and just being a good human, doing charity work. And I always thought, if I ever become a millionaire, I will give you know, so much back. I want to be like her. I want to help children in different countries. And I just, just want to give, give back, right? And on the table... I would say my two biggest inspiration were always Alison Fisher and Jasmine Ocean. Obviously, we all watched Alison play, right? Uh, she was my hero. She still is. She's incredible. And Jasmine, uh, I really admire her work ethic and dedication. And I actually took, uh, I took an example, you know, how the athlete should be by watching her doing her CrossFit, her uh, workouts, the way she carries herself, the way she practices, because she is the definition of the real athlete. And this is what I want to be. I remember Jasmine came to Bulgaria when I just started playing pool maybe a year or two before she came. And it was, it, that was very inspiring too, because she's a great athlete. First of all, that made me much more dedicated to, to, the, to working out and going to the gym and really keeping myself in shape, eating, eating healthy. And uh, I, I think these two things are like main, not just for playing pool, just, just to live good in general, right? But in order to keep your mind shape and to feel good when you have to play long, long matches, uh, that's very important. Who is you know? Okay. Uh, it's, it's probably my mother. It's probably her mother. Because uh, in the early age, her early age, uh, her mom is traveling with her, so they are been doing years with the traveling in the tournament. So before, after the tournament, 
uh, her mother will give some advice or to trying to uh, talk to her. And so uh, her mother is traveling with her uh, since uh, she was eight, starting to uh, learning pool. So her mother is one of the, the, the person to understand her and, and know uh, how about her thought and how about her feeling during uh, she's uh, in the tournament. Who have been your heroes and role models in pool? Um, I'd say Allison Fisher and April Larson. Uh, I kind of grew up around April in Minnesota, so um, she was just always the older sister for me and role model pool player, kind of showing me what I want to be when I grow up. And I think Allison, just she's been in the game so long and she's been at the top of the game for so long, so I really respect that. And she's just a great person also, so um, I'd say those two for sure. There's so many out there. Um... I mean, obviously, my parents are big role models for me. My father had a love of the game. He's kind of why I first started playing. Not that he was teaching me, but I just wanted to be around him. And I've always found that he, uh, his competitive spirit kind of became my competitive spirit. Sorry. And then um, for me, my mother uh, is a strong role model because she's just as she was, she raised me on her own, really, you know. And so being a strong woman, uh, that was my she was kind of my biggest role model growing up but also i'm going to give a shout out to Jeanette Lee because she really paved the way for women in pool and um made a name for herself and kind of made women's women's pool what it is today and so she's always been a big role model for me as well what actually is wild is my my coach june myers who's on the wpba she's the one who got me into the BEF, she as soon, when I was nine, she took me aside because I joined junior leagues, and she's the one who said, "I will train you for three months, you know, before the BEF Junior Nationals, and I will get you in tip-top shape, and we are going to try to go win it." And I got second that year. So she, it, it's it's wild how my first, you know, coach was a female, and I really think that that helped shape the future of my career. What are your recollections of the first times you started beating men players on a consistent basis? Oh, I love it because I just remember so many people telling me women cannot be as good and I shouldn't be on the team. And I was just like, oh, yeah, wait, I'll, I met you another day. So, um, yeah, I love to compete with the men, um, but also because I obviously recognize they are much better in our sport or in most likely, to be honest, any sport, men are kind of... Uh, better than a woman so for me it's always a good challenge because I can learn so much and grow on it so yeah I don't see it uh, in a negative perspective all positive it's definitely funny because when you're a little girl and you just go to an out in the tournament nobody cares but when you start beating the guys and going deeper and deeper that's where the controversial things start happening and I I remember facing some of the very harsh comments when I was little saying, well, women shouldn't even be allowed to play in men's tournament. Well, if she's allowed to play in our tournament, why we can't go and play in women's, right? So when you're not winning, nobody cares. When you start winning, of course, people's <laughs> going to start complaining. So that's one of the things that uh, I faced when I was younger. Really interesting stuff, isn't it? I mean, great perspective from, from the various women. Yeah, very cool to hear them talk about, you know, just from their perspective, the, the mental differences, the, the physical differences in, in playing pool. Um, really enjoyed hearing, you know, who's, who's motivated them, who got them into the game, who their role models were. And, of course, you hear some, some names you're so familiar with, Allison Fisher yeah. and Jeanette Lee and, and that kind of thing. And, you know, of course, some of the external challenges they face in kind of a male-dominated sport, which I, I think most would expect, but still – always good to hear their perspective and, yeah. and kind of how they got started. And one of the things that really stood out to me just watching that is the international flavor, right. you know, from all over the world, these ladies, can I mean, you go back to the, to the nineties, you had primarily a, a domestic American yeah. uh, contingent of players. And then you start seeing an Allison and a Karen core and Kelly Fisher and some of the other Europeans, you know, Ava Lawrence, obviously coming over. And, and then today I feel like, it's it's, it's, an international it's game. very <laughs> much an international, you know, all the top players seem to come from across the globe. And uh, 
you know, I think that's a testament to to the women that have come before them that have motivated them. So very cool. Yeah, there's no. That's a good. It's a good point. How, how the women before them have have built the game to the point where you know you've got players. The world is so much smaller, and you have players coming from all over the world to mm -hmm. play. Um, what I found interesting, like you, was was that the, all these women are from all over the world, Asia, Europe, you know, the U.S. places like that, and uh, but they all kind of went through the same right. process, yeah. right? They 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 had the same barriers, they mm -hmm. had the same challenges, um, and so there's you know not surprising there is great camaraderie and understanding among the women pro players, which is really cool to see. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So we caught up with those women at the Las Vegas Predator Pro Billiard Series tournaments where there were five events over a 10-day stretch. The women were involved in three of the tournaments, the Las Vegas Women's Open, the Apex Mixed Doubles Championship, and the 16-player Women's Showdown. Those events ran concurrently with the Men's Las Vegas Open and the World 10 Ball Championship, all staged at the Rio Hotel and Casino. Incredibly, talking about international flavor, all five titles that were up for grabs in Las Vegas were captured by Asian players. In the Las Vegas Open 10 Ball Championship, Lee Van Corteza of the Philippines defeated countryman Carlo Beato in straight sets 4-2 and 4-0 to claim the $30,000 top prize in the 96 player field. Along the way, Cortez survived three sudden death spot shot shootouts in the unique PBS format. Team USA veteran Tyler Steyer finished tied for fifth and was the highest finisher among the American players. In the 64 player Las Vegas Women's Open, another Filipino star reigning women's world 10 ball champion, Cheska the Flash Sentinel, scored another big win, stopping China's Siming Chen in straight sets in the title match, 4-2 and 4-2. In an amazing display of Asian dominance in the women's game, seven of the final eight players were from Asia, with Austria's Jasmine Aushin, who finished fifth, the only exception. Next on tap in Las Vegas, was the eight-team mixed doubles competition where the Taiwanese pairing of Shei Yu Chao and Yun Ling Chang topped the team of Great Britain's Kelly Fisher and Greece's Alex Kazakis in the final. In the semifinals, the Taiwan duo avenged their world team's title match loss to Germany's Pia and Josh Filler, while Fisher and Kazakis beat Tyler and Margaret Steyer. Women's world number one Chow continued her stellar play in the Invitational 16-player Women's Showdown, defeating Christina Takach in three sets, 1-4, 4-0, and 4-2, in the title match to claim the $35,000 top prize. Chow, the 2022 World 10-Ball Champion and 2023 World 9-Ball Champion, actually rebounded from a straight-set opening round loss to Margaret Pefalova Steyer winning five consecutive matches to claim the title. The biggest event in Las Vegas, however, was the 64-player World 10-Ball Championship, a star-studded affair that featured defending champion Eklat Kachi of Albania, American powerhouse Shane Van Boney, world number one Josh Filler, and double world champion Francisco Sanchez Ruiz of Spain. But it was quiet Filipino assassin Carlo Beato, who stole the show and the $75,000 top prize. The 40-year-old former World 9-Ball champion added the World 10-Ball crown to his trophy case with an impressive seven-match run that included wins over Van Boning, Yun Ling Chang, U.S. Open winner Ping Chung Ko, and Fetter Gorst. In the title match, Beato stopped Japan's entertaining and talented Nayuki Oi 3-1 in the best of five sets final. It was Oi's second World 10-Ball title match in three years, having lost to Eklan Kachi in 2021. We caught up with the new world champion following his win, and here's what he had to say. So tell me what it feels like, the World 9-Ball champion, US Open champion, yeah. World 10-Ball champion. Yeah, I'm very happy that I, uh, uh, finally I get a World 10-Ball championship. Uh, I have already a World Nine Ball Championship, uh, World Games, uh, U.S. Open, and now uh, World Ten Ball. 
so I'm very, very happy right now. Tell me about the match itself. How did the match go? You started out very strong. Second set was a little bit of a problem, and then you uh, made some mistakes. Yeah, in the beginning, I almost played perfect. Yeah. And in the second uh, set, still still uh, play good, but uh, we we uh, we have a safety battle, and also uh, the in the second set the score is three one. I'm leading already, and uh, I give it, I give him a. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, I, I have a safety on that 3-1 uh, score I'm leading, and he kicked the the safe, and and after that, he he made that in the, I mean, he won in the second set, yeah. and uh, in the third set, I I said I said to myself that um, I need to relax, just stay focused, and be smart on the table. That's what I'm doing. That's why I won in the match. That was a lot of pool. Yeah, a lot, a lot going on in Vegas. Huh? You got to be tired trying to it keep was, up with all that. It was exhausting, but it was it was great because there were five events. I love. I've always loved these international events where they have men's and women's tournaments yeah. going on at the same time because they complement each other so well, and it makes it so much more exciting. Um, and I think the men behave a little better with the women around. <laughs> uh, so no, it was it was it was great events. Predator. Hats off to them yeah. uh, for putting all those on. They've done a lot for the women's game, obviously, as some of the women mentioned. And um, you know, it was just it was just some some great some great tournaments. And the format with the sets as opposed to long races uh, makes for very interesting yeah. competition. And uh, it was it was a lot of fun. So while you were running around trying to follow all the the drama happening on the table, I'm back here in St. Louis, <laughs> and I'm seeing all this drama unfold off the table, things like bathroom breaks and dress codes and drug tests. And there, there was a lot of like little things adding up. And uh, there was a lot. And, and, and for you, you know, having run a lot of these national events yeah. with, with, you know, very strict and set rules that you expect everyone to know, uh, you can empathize with both the player and the, uh, you know, the, the producers of the event at the same time, because it's, um, you know, there were, bathroom break foul yeah so you, you, you had back the, within seven minutes you got penalized a game and the other person got the break the next day so in a yeah, race so you to, lost so you lost a game and then gave up the break and that happened to, to sky woodward that was the most to, a visible one that right. showed up on it social happens, media but it happened to several it happened others right to several other players and listen when you're in a race to four sets and it's winner's break yeah and you give up that first game and the break in the second game you're, you're, you're chasing. Yeah. Uh, so there was those instances. Uh, there were instances of uh, players touching the ball on the leg. Yeah. Now, the rule is that when a referee places the balls for the leg, you cannot touch them. Yeah. Okay. Now, that's the rule. Someone's going to have to explain to me why that's a rule, but that's the rule. Uh, and so several players touched the ball, and you forfeit the break yeah uh so that was the and then there was in a winter break format again that's guess, short that's a race big, that's big a big advantage. deal yeah it's a big advantage and the uh some dress code violations dress code violation was cheska sentinel of the philippines uh went to her table and she had long pants on but had like ankle socks on and so the the edge of her pants weren't touching the top of her socks and she got called out and told she was going to forfeit if she didn't change and had to go change. And so, you know, it was, you know. Yeah. And there, there was some dry, there were some dress code issues with Sky Woodward as well. Right. It seemed uh, like that was he had something with the players, flag, the yeah, American flag. In, in a world championship, you're required to have your nation's name and our flag okay. on your jersey. And there were several players who didn't. So what the promoters did was it said, OK, we've got this, you know, drawer full of flags to stick on your jersey uh and we'll do that for you but you're paying 10 bucks for the flag right right so you know listen rules are rules sure and they were all correct right um some of it's a matter of how strict do you want to be with them how much you know one of my arguments is that these players play all over the world for all kind of promoters all types of types of formats disciplines the rules are different in every one i don't Really, and I'm not really not surprised when a player from Taiwan hasn't read and memorized the nine pages of rules for the World Ten Ball Championship, right? Yeah. So it's kind of on them, but um, there's there's got to be a little bit of give and take there, in, in my opinion. Yeah, you know, you mentioned. I mean, APA runs a lot of big events, so I, I 
in a lot of ways, I side with the promoter. I side <laughs> with, with Predator here because I, I know the, the challenges we have when it comes to dress code and, and enforcing. And it's like, if it's going to be a rule, you have to enforce it, right? Because then it's, then it's pointless and you can't selectively enforce it. So I get that, that the bathroom break thing, I, I totally get that too. It's like you're putting on these events, you're live streaming, uh, suddenly you have a huge break in the middle and, and at the same time, I, I, I use bathrooms myself so I can <laughs> empathize a little bit there. And in Vegas, sometimes you gotta go a little further. And, There's and no space for you known, there. Players have been known to use a bathroom break as kind of a move, Yeah. you know? So, um, so listen, I, I get that and I understand that all. Uh, so, you know, the players, I think they need to know they be ahead of time that this is an event, there's a world championship that's going to have, you know, very strict and set rules, study them before you come, have your rule book in your pocket, whatever you need to do. Um, you know, that's, that's, that's part of the process of professionalizing the game, yeah, correct? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So the other interesting thing that I saw pop up, and again, it seemed like a lot of these things, you know, ended up involving Sky Woodward, who's one of our favorites, our Team USA <laughs> favorite, like don't mess with our guy. But that had to do with drug testing. At, so he gets eliminated from the tournament. Uh, and, and I mean, he's packing up his queue and getting his things together. And here comes uh, like a WPA official basically saying that you have to submit to a drug test. And I, I think for a lot of folks out there, one, they're surprised that there's drug testing in pool. Like what, you know, what kind of yeah. substance can help you in pool? But also, you know, if you look at the thing, you know, you look at the bathroom thing where he got the, this guy got the yellow card and the, the dress code thing. And now there's the, the <laughs> drug test thing. And, you know, you kind of look at it and you're like, are you guys picking on, on our guy? Like, what's yeah. up with this? Well, that was certainly the reaction of social media. Right. Uh, it was certainly the reaction of Sky's mother and, and fiance. Right. Uh, so, you know, not, not surprising and somewhat understandable uh, that people would get upset by that. Uh, Sky's, you know, one of the most congenial, easiest to deal with people yeah. in all of professional pool. Uh, but you know, when things start to pile on, you start to shake your head a little bit and say, is there, you know, is this conspiracy stuff? As far as the drug testing, again, if you want to be a professional sport, if you want to be a worldwide sport, uh, that's connected to the IOC world championships are subject to drug testing and it's random to an extent. Uh, it's random to the extent that anyone can get picked, but, uh, over the course of a year, Players from each continent have to be sure to be picked. So you've got a little bit of a quota there. Um, you know, they, the drug testing is very expensive, and they fly in a drug tester from Poland, I believe, wow. to do this. So they're not going to have them in there for 10 days. Yeah. Uh, you do need to pretty much wait until the player's out of the tournament so that they're, you know, you're getting them at the, at the end of their run. Uh, you're not throwing their game off. You're not giving them a chance to do something after they're tested, things yeah. like that. So uh, in, in the case of Sky, I think a North American player had to be selected. Uh, and in the final 16, there were only two North American players. It was right. Guy and Shane. So uh, after that, the two finalists, uh, Beato and Oi, both, as soon as the title match was over, got led off the stage to be also tested. Also tested, right? okay. So, you know, there, there is fairness in there. It's not picking on someone and right. not looking to bust someone it, that's not the that's not the idea of right. it is, is to profile someone and say i think he looks like a drug user or sure. he looks like he's been you know using steroids for his break or whatever the case yeah. is so um you know it, it it all falls within the um the scope of being a professional worldwide sport yeah and i remember back to 2018 you know we're getting ready for the moscone cup everybody's heading to london and news comes out that mario he who was on team europe uh, was basically dismissed because he he failed a a drug yeah. test based on some prescription he was taking for yeah. some medication. That's and I mean it, to me that was the most notable that I can recall. It of, was heartbreaking. Yeah, and, and anybody who still sees Mario, he you know, talks well, he, about that. And he's and not been back on Team not, Europe no, since. Has not, not made he's his not way qualified back. Qualified since. So, yeah. Uh, everybody, I think everybody hopes Mario he makes Moscone Cup. Yeah, days, for sure. Yeah, just yeah. interesting. So lots of things happening off the table in, yes. in Las Vegas as well. But, you know, when you have that many events, that many people, it's, you know, things are bound to happen, right? So. Well, and as you well know, you need to know the rules when you play, right? All the rules. And our first rule is to heed the advice of our resident instruction guru, Jeremy Jones, who's here now with another installment of Coach's Corner. Hello again, everyone. I'm Jeremy Jones, and we're here with another episode of Coach's Corner. 
We're here to talk about the mental process, or as some say, the pre-shot routine. So what we have here is a game of nine ball, and we've just broke the balls. We've had a good break with three on the break, which is sweet. But what we do first when it comes to the mental process is we get behind the shot we're looking at, and we try to make some type of decision. Um, as you get better, the decisions come easier. Um, but a good decision or a bad decision, they both can be learned from. So in our first process, again, we're assessing what we have here. We have a shot on the one ball to the corner, and we're going to try and come two rails to the three. That's the decision I've made. Now, once we start to make the decision, really the mental process or the pre-shot routine comes down to just basically gathering information. And when we gather information, we want to keep this as mild as possible. You know, in other sports, reaction sports, you know, they have to react quickly. So they look at the rim playing basketball, they look at the baseball playing baseball. But in pool, we can actually take our time a little more and gather more information because we're a stationary sport. So, but again, the key is to gather information in a mild way. We don't want to overload the brain. So now, again, we've made our decision. So we're going to look at gathering that information I was talking about. We're first going to kind of look at how the cue ball wants to come off the one ball. What's the natural angle there? And then we want to come two rails, so we, have, we realize we have to apply a little spin to the ball. But what happens is when we start to look at these routes, we're feeding the brain information that not only gives us our tip position, but gives us our swing speed for the shot itself. So again, very, very important uh, not to trip out about the information too much. Uh, realize it's just everything's very, very mild, and all it's doing is basically making your swing better. Um, now, the one last thing we do uh, with the mental process, which leads us to the physical process, which we'll learn in later episodes, is we come look the ball to the hole. And when we look the ball to the hole, we're, again, we're not trying to do much more than look at the path we want the ball to travel. Now, another thing that's so good about your pre-shot routine that I think is probably the biggest quality of it all is when you're in a, a co competitive situation, I've been in many, the Moscone Cup, uh, US Open, uh, plenty of league back in the day. Um, what it does is, to me, it's almost like a slow day at work versus a busy day at work. And what I mean by that is when you're gathering this information, you may start to ignore that you're in the finals of the tournament. You may start to not realize it's hill, hill in the match and you're in a pressure situation because you're busy doing things. So it kind of preoccupies the mind. You're always going to realize it's the finals. But if we can dummy that down a few ways and be productive while we're doing so, that's really the ticket to the pre-shot routine and the mental process. So again, we're going to look into the hole for the last we're going to try and come two cushions to gain position on the three. So again, gather some information just to make the stroke a little better. Who reads Billiards Digest? Who doesn't? Want to break into a better game? Get private lessons from the best? For more than 40 years, Billiards Digest has kept pool fans informed on their favorite game. Every month, BD offers tips from the top pros, profiles on the game's heroes, and in-depth coverage of the top tournaments. Take your game to the next level. Get 12 monthly issues of Billiards Digest for just $32. Order today at BilliardsDigest.com and read like a pro. Now let's jump into some big news that happened around the billiard world. First, Matchroom announced an astonishing 10-year deal with the Ministry of Sport for Saudi Arabia and the Saudi Arabian Billiards and Snooker Federation to hold the World Pool Championship with a $1 million purse. There's no word yet on what the top prize will be, but expect it to be north of $200,000 to the winner. The 2024 World Pool Championship will take place the first week of June at the Greens Hall in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. 
Now, perhaps not surprisingly, the news was immediately followed by a release from the World Pool Association, or WPA, announcing on February 28th that it was removing its threatened March 1st ban on unsanctioned tournaments and would be, quote, treating all matchroom events as sanctioned through 2024. The WPA release mentioned continuing talks with Matchroom to resolve sanctioning issues, although Matchroom responded with its own release, stating that while talks continue, no resolution has been reached. While confusion still rules the day, players at least appear to be in the clear to participate in any event that they choose to play in, at least for now. Yeah, <laughs> just when you think everything's worked out, there's still a little controversy there. But, uh, you know, all eyes had been on this March 1st deadline since yeah. last, what, October when WPA Correct. put this out last fall. And, uh, you know, so I think everybody was expecting what, what's going to happen, what's going to happen. Everybody knew the Vegas dates and that kind of thing. And uh, sure enough, you know, in this high stakes game of of chicken, right, yeah, right. I, I you know, I, I think WPA blinked first there. And, I don't uh, think there's any doubt about it. I, yeah. just, I think WPA was fortunate that it was a leap year and they had 29 days to make <laughs> yeah. up their decision yeah. in February because once Matrim announced its decision, uh, the WPA really had to respond yeah. uh, before March 1st. Yeah. I think they were, they were waiting and hoping that a joint release could be uh, put out where they had reached an agreement, but... Matrim was not going to rush into an agreement, and I think Matrim likely said, you know, we're just going to string this out a little bit longer and force their in. Uh, so, but, you know, again, the, the good news out of this all is that for the time being, at least, it seems like professional players, you know, who are tied into national federations that are strong, uh, they don't have to worry about events that they play in and events that they don't play in. If, if there's a big event coming up, they want to participate in it. They don't have the threat of bans or, you know, recrimination, whatever, hanging over their heads. Yeah. Now, the way I read that, I, does that does that just apply to the Matchroom World Nine Ball Tour events? Because it seemed like it was specifying those. I mean, what about events outside of that realm that are not WPA sanctioned that a pro player might want to? participate in is that still yeah. subject to the ban no i don't think there's any ban for any players in any event at okay. this point by the wpa uh, and most of the events that are the larger events are either wpa or matchroom events so i don't think the players you know there's too many events that would fall under the wpa sanctioning guidelines that aren't either you know one one or the other so okay. i think it's pretty much carte blanche for the players at this point yeah so uh, you know it's a, it's certainly a win for the players and you know don't want to get lost in all that but kudos to to match room on the world championships i think it's yeah. a 10-year deal in saudi it's arabia a deal million dollars a year that's pretty phenomenal it is phenomenal it's great for the players it's kind of um, that next step that they kept talking about in this progression of establishing a true tour yeah. and, and, and actually getting it to the point where the players can make a living playing on this tour. So, uh, you know, to me, this million dollar purse and $200,000 top prize puts some heat on Matchroom to bump up the prizes in their other events, mm -hmm. right? So when you have a $200,000 top prize and the rest of your big open major championships are $50,000 first prize, it doesn't look great. So I, I would imagine that this is going to light a fire under them to start to increase the prize money at all those events, which then you're starting to get into that, uh, you know, position of being able to offer, you know, a, a, a decent living to the top players. Yeah. And those players going to Saudi Arabia, they better read those rules too, because the that's, rules in that's, the rules in Saudi Arabia are you think yeah. those, the predator rules yeah. are strict. You yeah. better be careful over yeah. there. Uh, I've got, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to that event, and I've already read through all the rules for Saudi Arabia, and yeah, and I'm not happy about some of them, but but we'll we'll make do. <laughs> yeah, you better leave the quarantine cocktail recipes yes. at home. Yes, uh, yeah, my my vermouth <laughs> bottle is going to stay at home. I always carry that with me, but but nice. not for here. Now, earlier, we were treated to great perspective from some of our favorite women players for Women's History Month. We also got a chance to sit down for a longer discussion on the topic with, for my money, the greatest women player in the history of the sport, Allison Fisher. As always, she has some interesting thoughts on her career as a champion and an ambassador. 
Um, so we're here celebrating Women's History Month, and tomorrow or Friday is International Women's Day. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's talk about pool from from women's perspective, um, and and it's you've got a really great perspective on this because mm -hmm. you came up in snooker, which you know the disparity between mm -hmm. the men and women in the UK in professional mm -hmm. snooker mm -hmm. is bigger than oh, wow, anywhere. Yeah. Uh, tell me what that was like. Well, from a child, let's say from, from being a child playing snooker in my local pub okay. with one table, and I played with the guys from the age of about 12, 13 years old, I didn't think about gender. I wasn't thinking. I was a kid playing snooker. And then one day I looked in the newspaper, I was 14, and um, I saw women's snooker world championships i thought oh women have their own tournaments it yeah. didn't even occur to me before that i wasn't even thinking about it yeah. i played in league and that was a big deal because in league four there were certain pubs that didn't allow me to go play really because i was female not because i was a child but because i was female so that was not nice. what did you think about when the first time you heard that you couldn't play in a, in a, in a pub because it was because you were female. Yeah, and my mum or whatever couldn't come in to watch even if I could. So it was just ridiculous. It was like, it was very much male-dominated, chauvinistic world <laughs> that I grew up in. Yeah, so snooker, you won all the world championships, but but snooker as, as a women's sport was never growing. I couldn't see the future. And, you know, what turned out amazingly well for you is that you, at that time, the Women's Professional Billiard Association was really starting to get rolling with the classic tour. A lot of sponsorship, TV time, things like that. And that gave you an opportunity that you probably never thought you would have to uh, make the next level in Q sports, make a, a living out of a level in Q sports. You know, if the women's classic tour was not around then, how different would your life have been? It's so interesting. I never thought about it not being around until you <laughs> said that today. I got a one-way ticket to America, and I was like, on the plane, what am I doing? I've got, a, <laughs> I've got a suitcase and a queue, and that's it, literally. I didn't know what I was doing. Bit of debt in England. I came out, you know, with some debt, and I was like, well, I can always turn back, but right. I might, might not be able to go forward again. So as soon as I got off the plane, walked into that club in Charlotte, North Carolina, Mother's, Mother's Billiard Parlor yeah. for my very first tournament, I felt at home straight away. I knew it. As soon as I walked in and played the event and in the event I finished ninth and I won the equivalent or more than I would have winning a tournament in England so I was like I was over the moon yeah. what did the other women that you met over here Ava Lori John Jeanette what did you learn from them about being a woman player in in the US was it, was it different than Very, the UK was it First of all, I want to say that they welcomed me with open arms. That was really important because obviously I was a world traveler. I was a champion in my neck of the woods. Right. But they really opened their arms and hearts up to me. They didn't, they were, there was not negativity right. per se. And I think that is that part of, yeah. it, it, it helps your journey, Comfort living level. somewhere, coming to another country, you're on your own. Yeah. You know, so it made a world of difference because I've met some of them before too. So that really helped. And the professionalism, the camaraderie among them was really impressive. Yeah. And and I, that's part of the reason I felt at home. I felt almost instantly accepted here, whereas in England I wasn't as close with the people there, funnily yeah. enough. Was it a camaraderie that was pool player camaraderie was a camaraderie as women pool players both i think yeah. i don't think i would could differentiate i could see the friendships of laurie john robin ava you know and all these players and obviously you're going to gravitate to certain personalities sure. that's life that's just what you do right but i could see the fun and the genuineness between them yeah, all. yeah. yeah. and they were all winners at the time yeah there wasn't Champions, i mean yeah. laurie john was obviously probably a little edge, more of an edge dominating wise I think right. consistency wise right. but they all won tournaments right so that's probably why there's a lot more camaraderie too when you think back on it what women inspired you in your youth and, and even later in life whether it was on the table or off the table well I didn't have female 
in in my sport, it was more the men. It was right. like Steve Davis. Right. I sort of emulated, if you like. He was my favourite player in snooker because we right. didn't see women snooker players right. on TV, so I didn't have anyone to aspire to there. There were other th female athletes that I met along the way, and back in the day, Sally Gunnell was a runner, you know, Olympic runner that I met, and you know, she won a gold medal in the Olympics. What did um, you learn from meeting people like that? What, how were you inspired down, by that? Do you know, that? at the end of the day, everyone's down to earth. We're all in the same boat, really, living life, right. trying to do our best. And so I, I love that about a lot of these athletes. They're not snooty or, you know, yeah. I'm better than you. But you have to have a killer instinct too, don't you? Yeah. And I think coming over here, one of the people with a real killer instinct was Jeanette, wasn't it, yeah, really? Yeah, she was, yeah. She would do anything, you know? <laughs> <laughs> do you know what I mean? But that's impressive yeah. because that makes you work harder. Yeah. And if somebody is doing something in the sport that isn't being done by other people, they're standing out. Yeah, sure. And not only that, if one does well, everyone does well in a way. You have to look yeah. at it from that perspective. Yeah. It raises everyone up. Right. And you have to look at things logically like that, I think. Role models. Who are your women role models? Who are your women role models? My now? mother yeah. has always been a role model to me. She's feisty. She's positive. <laughs> she Any word that comes out of her mouth is positive. I get comfort. Now she lives with me. I see her every day. But <laughs> are the cameras I always, still positive? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. We've had fun, though. We're like best friends. Yeah. But listening to her voice always. Soothing lifted effect, me. It was very effect. soothing, always positive. So when I was here, she was there. That was, you know, obviously I missed her, but I have a lot of her character and I'm proud that I do. Her personality and her confidence, her, her outlook on life has yeah. always been wonderful. So she's always, she would be my biggest role model. Yeah, um, yeah definitely. Yeah. Definitely. What do you tell younger female players, women players, young young girls who are playing, what do you tell them about, uh, you know, taking on this sport? Well, anything that you want to do well at, it takes persistence and, and that creates consistency. You, it's repetition. It, you're constantly working on your physical presence at the table, how you come into a shot. There's lots of parts to the game. And you have to master each part. Right. And so you've got to work on consistency. And it's it's not, it's pretty ugly sometimes. It's hard. Practice is hard. But that's what creates a character and creates the, you know, I'm not going to fail attitude. You know, if you want something enough, you'll get it if you yeah. put in the effort. Right. And all these players here, you can see, obviously with the digital age now and you can go on social media, you can see the effort they're putting in. Yeah. Whether it be the travelling around, going in tournaments, or whether the it be the social the, media, yeah. you know, inspiring other people to play, yeah. juniors. Juniors, you've got to work at it. And I love the junior game right now. There's some great it's, junior it's, players. It's really more organised and, exactly. and at a higher level. And I like of that. that in America, they're putting the effort in now to the juniors to create events because it's not easy. And thankfully, the parents supporting their kids. Looking at it is a respectable sport now, not just that image that it once had. So with these young players in the sport, whether they're men, women, kids, there's something to look up to. And how do you view yourself as a, you know, there's a lot of young girls coming up playing mm. who view you as a role model, you as a hero. What, what kind of responsibility comes with that? I think it's important to always exude good sportsmanship at the table, on and off the table shake the hands with the fans and smile with them. Sometimes it's not easy to do if you've just lost or yeah, whatever. Sure. But it's important because they're the people that idolise and look up to you and support you and they'll support the people coming up through the rankings. It's important to enjoy the whole process because one day we won't be doing yeah, it anymore. Yeah, yeah. And we'll look back and think, wow, that was something special really when it was it. happening. So I always appreciate it. It gives me little tingles now thinking about it. <laughs> Because they'll come an end one day yeah, yeah. and you'll think how lucky I was to, yeah. to be doing it, be part of something really big. Yeah. And to me, I just want to say this, it is, I've been involved in Q Sports for 40 odd years, plus years, and I don't regret anything that I've done in it because it's been, you grow up 
as a team yeah. and a family that I've known you for yeah, years. Yeah, yeah. And you know what it is. It's, it, it's, it's a family. You go it through is. life together. You go through highs and lows. Yeah. And, it, you know, and you can have a laugh. You can share life events. You know, I've got kids now. My life's changed. Yeah. And it's just one, it's a, been a wonderful experience it's an incredible all around. Community. It really is a community. Yeah. And I would not change a thing that I've done in my life. Never. I'm glad. Yeah, it's been amazing. Alison Fisher, happy International Women's Day. Thank you, Mike. <laughs> Thank you for doing this. Great perspective from our, our resident U.S. citizen. And, and Team USA player now, Allison Fisher, yeah. uh, always a delight. Yeah, congratulations on the, on that interview. The Duchess of Doom, just a outstanding representative of, uh, you know, not just women's pool, but but really just women in general. I mean, the way she carries herself. I actually had a chance to really kind of get to know Allison in the early 2000s when we sponsored her. You know, she would be at our events, and we do a lot of work together, and just... Uh, class act you know through and through i mean exceptional on the table but just off the table the way she carries herself you heard a lot of the the younger players referring to her as yeah. as a inspiration or a role model you hear allison talking about how she takes that seriously because i mean you're talking now multiple generations of players that have had allison fisher as kind of that person right yeah. i mean she's she mentioned 40 years now in q sports and so it's it's not just you know one group or two groups it's multiple generations that are, are looking upon her and uh what better representative could the, the sport of pool have no, it, on the female side than, than allison fisher of course i mean you, you look at her and if, if you had to dial in the you know the definition of an ambassador for the game it would be allison because her level is the best that the game has ever seen yeah and uh, she's always carried herself well. She's a great spokesperson. She's someone the players can look up to, young players. Um, you know, she's, yeah, she, she's what you want your sport to, to have as a role model and, and ambassador for sure. Absolutely. Now, you mentioned it at the beginning of, of the post-interview segment here. Uh, she is now a U.S. citizen. She has been this just happened. years. Yeah, but, but just recently she received... Is it WPA approval to represent the United States now in events? Yeah, she's actually asked the WPA uh, for that designation several years ago. Uh, but the WPA follows the IOC rules, which at that time stated that uh, you had to not participate in any international competitions as a British uh, under the British flag for three years before you could change. To, and that was, you know, with, with the Olympics, that's one thing because it's four years between right. attempts, right? But for her, that would have taken her out of so many WPA international competitions that she didn't do it. But she kept petitioning them. And I think part of the uh, impetus to kind of move it forward a little faster was when Matchroom you know, designated better, better gorse yeah. is, is ability to play under the U.S. flag. And I think the WPA realized that it was a little stubborn in its in its determination of her, you know, citizenship fate. Uh, and so she is allowed to compete now in world competitions, whether it's the world games, uh, things like that under the American flag, which is great, or world team billiards. Um, you know, she played with Shane Van Boning in the mixed doubles event in Las Vegas. Uh, nice. So, you know, so there's there's opportunity for her there. And, and, and obviously, she's got a much better chance of gaining a, a, a selection to a worldwide event as a U.S. citizen than as a European. Because okay. the field is pretty stacked in Europe these days. Yeah. Well, should we start a, a letter writing campaign to Matchroom lobby to get her on Team USA at the Moscone Cup now? And you know, if, if she, you know she, she could be a wild card pick, right? She's an American. <laughs> Not citizen. unheard of to have a female on the Moscone she team. Did. If you go back to the beginning, it's been a number she of years. Was in but... the first one. Yeah. There you so, go. Uh, yeah. So it's uh, <laughs> different no, process no. these days different to get on process, that team. But... Different process, but um, yeah, it's it's just again just always. A delight talking to her. Her yeah. perspective is always great. Uh, she's very thoughtful and very smart and uh, just a, a credit to the game. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So let's take a look at what's coming up in pool over the next month. The U.S. Open 10-ball, 8-ball, 1-pocket, and Banks tournaments are currently going on at Griff's Billiards in Las Vegas. You can catch that live 
on Post Upstream or on Griff's Billiards TV's YouTube channel. We also have a couple of World Nine Ball Tour events coming up, the McDermott Classic and the FSR Nine Ball Open. The FSR Nine Ball Open is in Spain, McDermott Classic is in the Boston area. And then in the middle of the month, the Premier Pool League, uh, a matchroom major invitational event, which will be seen on DAZN, that will be taking place at Jason Shaw's Pool Room in Connecticut. Definitely a lot on the horizon. I feel like the year is just getting underway, but already so much has, has happened and so much still to happen. So it's going to be a great year. It's going to be a fun year. There's going to be, you know, tons of events. There's going to be a lot to cover this year. We're going to have a lot, lot to talk about for sure. Absolutely. That's going to wrap it up for us. For Jason Bowman, I'm Mike Pinozo. Thanks for joining us. May all your shots be hangers. And we'll look forward to seeing you next time on Billiards Digest Live.